welcome to this next panel. Um, my name is Katharina Kropshofer. I'm a climate journalist working for Viennese weekly newspaper Falta and the founder of the Network for Climate Journalism in Austria. I also welcome people on the live stream and people are listening at Radio Helsinki. As far as I know, there is a simultaneous translation, so do get your uh, headphones if necessary. Um, in this panel, we will try to breach a very broad spectrum of, of topics and expertises uh, and bringing it together through one lens, which is visions in a way. So we're imagining um, a future, a future that isn't always positive, um, especially when we look at the challenges ahead from climate change to rising populism and inequalities, anti-science sentiments, loss of species and habitats. And we might find ourselves experiencing very negative emotions. However, without losing a sense of reality, we also want to spend the next hour discussing how imagination and solidarity can help us transform our societies and move ahead uh, in this time of crisis, as we've heard in the last talk for the ones who were present. And uh, for this, I want to introduce our great panel. Uh, this is not a weird art installation. This is our very special guest live from Australia, uh, Jeff Malgen. Um, professor for Collective Intelligence, Social Innovation and Public Policy at University College London. He's the author of many books, uh, the latest being When Science Meets Power. Welcome. I hope you can hear us and you can talk to us as well. I think that's a yes. I can hear you. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, to my right is Clara Mora. She's a social economist working for different organizations such as Arbeit Plus and Amazkonferenz. She's a writer for Klima Soziale Politik uh, with expertise into how to pour climate justice and questions of inequalities into policies as well. And last but not least, Andrew Ringsmuth. Uh, he's a researcher at the Wegener Center for Climate and global change here in Graz, working on complex systems and the relationship between societies and natural systems and how those societies can co-evolve uh, with nature. We will have a Q&A afterwards, uh, but let's start with our Australian guest, um, since it's already midnight there, if I, if I count it correctly. Uh, if we listen to climate activists and, and many experts as well, you will find one thing that a lot of people agree on, which is that we're not moving fast enough uh, to solve this complex crisis, the climate crisis that we are in. Uh, on the other hand, there's people who will call this alarmist. So uh, before we talk about visions, maybe let's tackle the barriers um, that are on the way. Uh, Jeff, how would you judge the this, this speed of change on a behavioral, but also on a political or economical level? Well, in Australia right now, there are very widespread forest fires. You will probably all be aware of what's happened in recent years, huge uh, direct effects of climate. So climate has moved from being a very theoretical issue to a very practical issue. Slightly more than 10 years ago, a government attempted to put in place the world's first carbon tax, serious action on climate, and was rejected by the voters. There are lots of lessons actually here on the challenges of getting buy-in to climate action uh, politically. I don't think anyone would doubt that action is still too slow, but I think it's important we understand, and I hope we can get into this, how you persuade people that it's not just a question of sacrifice, of giving up their lifestyles, that we need new kinds of dialogue between the people in cities, often very highly educated, metropolitan, uh, who would tend to be very pro-climate action, and often people in the countryside, the small towns, in mining, in farming, who often see those actions as directly against their interests and against their cultures. And that's the political challenge, not just here, but obviously in countries like the Netherlands, certainly in Austria, uh, and we need much smarter strategies for bridging those divides than perhaps we had four, five, ten years ago. And when you look at the, the governments, do you feel like the discourse still circles around this, the sacrifice, or do you see a movement 
towards social innovation that actually brings in what you just said of, of, of building a vision that is necessary? Well, this, this is the creative challenge. I think in Europe, we still perhaps have a very strong, almost Christian sense of the virtues of sacrifice and martyrdom. Greta Thunberg was in some ways an exemplar of that, which works very well for a part of the population, but we now know doesn't work very much for others. So I think our task, if we're going to map out a roadmap for the next 20 or 30 years, which has to involve, in my mind, uh, serious carbon taxes, serious changes to regulations, serious changes to lifestyles, so everything from eating meat to, to driving cars, we need to show how that will make people's lives better. We need to show how that will create new jobs, new prosperity, happier cities, and new engagement with uh, nature. And crucially, and probably not the people in this audience, how this will benefit people with manual skills, how we move to an economy of maintenance and repair rather than one of uh, disposal. And I think we've been very slow to do that. I think the green movements of the world, because they are mainly urban, highly educated, quite affluent, have struggled to articulate a message often to, to say, more, uh, more rural, less educated, less prosperous communities. And this has become part of a culture war. As I say, this happened, I think, first in Australia, 12 years ago. We saw this pattern, and now you can see exactly the same pattern in pretty much every country in Europe. And, and if we don't break out of this pathology, then undoubtedly we will fail to take uh, enough action to prevent climate change. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Clara, we've heard about this challenge of, of lifestyle changes versus political changes, and I feel like this discourse often is stuck there, um, where we only try to, to change people's behavior, or we only focus on these individual um, changes that might be necessary or are necessary. How do you think do we get beyond that? How do we pour that into policies that are that work for many people and not just a few? Um, I think this is a very interesting question and if I would have the answer to it, um, I would probably be um, perhaps working for different organizations than, than I do. But um, I would say I totally agree with you that we are very much stuck in this um, individual policies um, and we kind of need to realize, also it, it resonates what Jeff ch was just saying, we, we need to get the idea out there that it could be so much better if we all make a joint effort. And the way there is not to stick with individual policies or only ask for um, structural policies also as an excuse not to change individual behavior, I would say. Because I think it's very important also to point out that there are um, in many um, in many ways, how, how our society is organized, how social policy is set up, we are stuck in some path dependencies to a certain extent, or structures and habits. For instance, if we look at work or at labor market policies, um, the way we do work and the way work is organized, it's very much, very often not very sustainable. There are like um, consumption of patterns, mobility patterns that keep us from acting sustainably. So there is really um, the need to change the structure in order to make individuals um, to um, to make it possible for them to make better better life choices and um, also um, live a more sustainable life. And I think it's very important, also like on a political level, to. to acknowledge that this is actually intertwined. We need to provide structures that enable individuals to make better choices. Um, and also, on the other hand, we need to establish structures that, um, that keep bigger and more powerful actors f from um, exploiting their power in a certain extent. To summarize quickly, um, you think there's also powers or forces um, in power that want that, that want to keep it on an individual level. Did I get that? Yes, right? definitely, right. definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and maybe coming to the, the, the third part of this equation, we talked about political um, solutions, individual changes, but there's also technological solutions that are often uh, talked about or brought into the equation as, as 
the big thing that we that we need from some uh, people or some actors. Um, Andrew, as a biophysicist, uh, you have worked a lot on this, or you have covered this a lot. What made you realize that this alone is not gonna gonna help us, if that's what you believe? Ah, okay. Uh, well, I, I, first I would say I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a total Luddite. I don't think that we should stop doing technology, of course not. But um, I, uh, well, maybe just to flesh out what you said a little bit. So I, I worked on renewable energy technology research for some years, and then in the process of doing that became convinced that, yes, it's important, but doing that alone is not going to solve our problem, is not going to get us out of this climate predicament. Um, so I, I think it, the, the session started with the question of doing things fast enough. and. It might be good to kind of put some numbers on that, right, to make it real for people. So um, there are some estimates uh, at, at the global level how fast we have to bring down our emissions in order to remain compatible with uh, the Paris Climate agreed Agreement goals. And uh, last I looked, uh, the, the rate was something like 7 to 8 percent. It's probably more now because we've delayed again, so probably more like 8, 9 percent per year, right, every year. Um, so to, to make that real, what, what that feels like at the right pace. Um, during the COVID-19 lockdowns, the early lockdowns in 2020, globally we managed to reduce emissions by something like 5.6%. So that level of radical economic action where we completely constrained our economy, right, there was much less mobility, much less trade, people's lifestyles changed dramatically, that almost got us to the level that we now need to be doing every year, right, and not just one year, but also the next year and the next year and so on. So if we wanna know what kinds of technologies could do that for us, um, on, on, that, on that time scale, rapid technological substitutions won't be enough. So I'm talking about phasing out carbon-based energy systems and phasing in renewable energies, right? We, we need to do those things, of course, and they are happening very quickly now, outpacing all of the predictions by serious institutions, so that's a good sign, right? But we need to understand just how radically urgent this is now. So the kinds of technologies that can help us with that are probably things more like the social media platforms that we have. But what they are currently doing is, is not helping us to work together to solve global problems. Instead, they seem to be dividing us because the purposes for which they are operating are, are not collective well-being and climate action, but rather to maximize the profits of the companies that have created them. So that means we, we, I think we need to see technology as an element in a large complex system, right? We've got this diabolically huge global economy, which is a complex adaptive system, and we've developed technologies to play certain roles in that system. If we want the system to have a new goal, if we want it to embark on this bold new trajectory of decarbonization, and, and not just carbon emission reduction, but em a reduction of, of our ecological impacts more broadly, because climate change is just one of six planetary boundaries that we are currently uh, overshooting. So um, do I think technology is important? Absolutely. Um, but we need to see it as a, a multi-time scale process. We need to pursue all of it with, with wartime urgency, in, in my view, if we believe the numbers, right, if we believe our own commitments to Paris and we look at the data about what's actually happening, we need to be doing things radically quickly. Uh, and and, and to, to, to leverage things like social media, this then brings in questions about governance and, and institutions versus market, right? So far, we've, we've left the governance of, of, those, of those companies basically up to the market. We let them do largely what they want with you know, some regulations, internal and external. But perhaps it's time to ask the question, do we need to be doing something more radical with these platforms? Do we need to say, all right, we've got this powerful technology here that can actually coordinate behavior across the planet in, in the, on, the order of, on the order of billions of people, and we've never had something like that before. Perhaps we could leverage that in a way that would help us instead of in a way that seems to be eroding our institutions and slowing us down. Why do you think it is so tempting to focus on these technological fixes in the view of some politicians, and what can we learn from that as well? Wow, um, I think there's many factors. So uh, most of us in this room um, have grown up in an era of incredible explosion of technologies that are really visible to us. So progress in microelectronics, the phones that you've presumably all got in your pockets, um, most of you will have heard of Moore's law, right? The, the, the law that the number of, uh, if I remember correctly, the number of transistors on a chip doubles every 18 months or something like that. That's held basically since the 70s. Um, so we are used to seeing dr dramatic techno technological breakthroughs happening right in front of us, and we think that that's representative of technology more broadly, right? But um, a commentator in this space named Vaclav Smil has, has called, uh, has named something called Moore's curse, right? This idea that we think that everything is reflected 
or that the, the pace of development in microelectronics reflects everything, like renewable energies and other technologies, but it doesn't. If you look at the, the growth trajectories of those different technologies, they're not like that. Um, so that's a bit of the technological reality, but why it's tempting? I think the short answer is because it allows us to kick the can down the road a little bit longer, right? Um, we will, um, I, I don't think that dealing with this problem seriously will, will mean only sacrifice. I think that there are ways that we can do it that will make life easier for many people. But it will mean some discomfort. It will mean that we have to change things, um, and that will be difficult. Um, and if we can, um, particularly if you're a powerful person who has benefited from the current system, if you can point the finger somewhere else and say, actually, that technological development is going to, that's almost there. And when that gets there, I won't have to change how, how I, what role I'm playing in this system. Um, you, it's not hard to see why you would push that kind of narrative if, if you were in that position. A lot of this talk so far has reminded me of uh, Kate Drever's uh, donut economy, if you're, if you're familiar with it, uh, which basically means we need to act economically within the planetary and social boundaries. Um, Clara, do you think there is a part of this that is, that is feasible or that we can already see that we're moving into this direction? Maybe it's easier to, to answer for the Austrian context. Is this something that is taken into account? Um something where it's already feasible to stay within planetary boundaries in the Austrian context. And in the economic system that we're, that we're moving in. I think it's very difficult to tell because if you um, look at the Austrian context in particular, you have this, this problem that on a global scale, we are among the top polluters because we are in the, I think, about eighth percentile of global income. Um, so realistically speaking, the boundaries between like the lowest standard and the highest standard of consumption and production that is possible, they will be very, very close together, which means um, immense changes in lifestyle for everyone, um, including people already experiencing poverty right now. And this is, of course, a very unpopular thing to say for vulnerable groups, for deprived people who already lack the resources in the current system, I would say. Um, and it will be crucial um, to, to have this new, like we are already moving in, in the direction of visions, I think, to have this vision, what could a good life mean within planetary boundaries? And I think for this, we will need a profound change on how we, um, how we, how we look at wealth and well-being. And we kind of will need to detach it from, from consumption, from growth growth of, of the gross national income, we will need to detach it from um, how much do we own, how much are we earning, how much are we able to consume, but rather find, find a way of defining wealth and well-being in terms of what can we do for each other, um, how, can we, can we be, um, how can we live a good life together. And I am very much afraid that I would say we are in Austria quite far away from, from this discussion because this, these are very, very hard conversations that we will need to have and um, people are afraid to have these conversations, I think, on all levels. And so like the, the technological fixes are always very much in the front of it. Mm -hmm. And thinking about what is happening right now, what I see happening in Austria, there's um, many trade unions, for example, that are cooperating with climate activists, uh, for example, the construction um, business that are saying, you know, we need to change our labor laws because it's going to be too hot for, for our workers. Um, and you could say the same thing on a global level that we saw during climate conferences uh, with people from the global south demanding um, more money in the first place, but also to be taken more seriously in this context. Do you see this as a sign of hope or a sign of, you know, like a bottom-up <laughs> approach that is happening right now? Yeah, I would definitely see in a way this is a sign of hope, also that the, uh, the debates between climate activists and also um, social policy activists are becoming more and more intertwined. Because I remember when I started working for the Austrian Anti-Poverty Network a couple of years ago, we started dealing with um, climate justice and the climate crisis as an issue. And like four years ago, it was not the most obvious issue to talk about when you talk about inequalities. And now it's like really, it's out there. And climate justice, um, climate racism, and perhaps I would also add climate classism 
are terms that are getting more and more reflected on and used, so this might be a sign of hope. Um, but on the other hand, um, we can also see the problem and the consequences of the climate crisis are already becoming so press pressing that we cannot longer ignore them. Like the trade unions in the construction business, it's very important they are, they are acting now, but perhaps it's already too little too late, so that would be also a more maybe pessimistic add-on, but probably would be better to stay with the positive visions. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about negative uh, visions as well a bit later. I want to bring uh, Jeff in again um, and touch on something you said before um, about people demanding action and when you actually asked them what they, you know, uh, what policies they would go along with um, and what they answer and how that can be a fuel for social innovation and change. When we look at citizen councils that have been taken into consideration in different European countries, also here in Austria, you will see that most people will ask for actually more strict uh, policies and would even donate part of their salary. What do we make of that? Is that something that is showing us the direction or is this just a nice tool that governments can put into place but then not act accordingly? So, as you say, there's quite a lot of citizen assemblies now at the city level and at the national level around climate action. And I think for them, as for all of us, the challenge is how do you strike the right place between anxiety and fear uh, that the climate is turning to disaster and hope that it's not completely hopeless, that it's, there's a fatalism. And 20 years ago, 22 years ago, I worked on the UK's first climate reduction, so carbon reduction strategy. And absolutely, as been said, we didn't want to depend just on technological fixes. That was never going to be plausible. Nor could we depend just on behavior change by the public. It had to be those, but also regulation and law. And I'd be intrigued whether you or the audience in that room, whether you know what happened in a country like the UK in the last 20 years on carbon emissions. So do any of you incidentally know the number? Andrew has had some numbers. What would you guess had happened to carbon emissions, including scope three, including imports? I don't Are know. you asking us on any? the panel as well? <laughs> yeah, I'm asking the three of you, just out of curiosity, do you know? I don't. Uh, I think I can take a guess. So uh, including scope three emissions, I think it's something on the order of 20%. Is that right in the last? It's, it's, no. No, it's, about, it's about 50% down. Okay. Now this matters because Often people don't understand actually that this, these problems are relatively tractable. They're difficult, they're really difficult. But weirdly, the activists tend to underplay how much has been achieved because they want people to be anxious. And the anti-climate action people don't talk about it because they don't care, which means that even really well-informed people often are over-fatalist. They think it's more difficult to shift our economy and our society than it is. I'm a bit surprised we achieved the 50% reduction, although I was part of the plan. We didn't really expect it to happen. And as many of you say, there's lots of difficulties in shifting your energy systems, your transport, your food, and so on. But my worry is that many people, and there's a lot of evidence on this, that although perhaps the 25 to 40 year olds tend to be a little bit more confident, the younger age group are often more fatalistic. They just think it's so difficult, nothing can be achieved. And that's partly caused by misinformation about what's actually happened in the last 10 or 20 years. And the citizens' assemblies you mentioned, one of the reasons they tend to be a bit positive is they actually engage with the facts. <laughs> they, you know, part of the process is actually an education process which leaves much better informed public. So I think it's really important, these discussions, we are appropriately nervous about all the things going wrong and at a global level, trends are in the wrong direction. But in many, many countries, there's quite rapid reductions in emissions, even including scope three and imports over the last five or 10 years. And if we don't celebrate what's been achieved, then actually we undermine the possibility of real impact in the next five or 10 years. Which emotion would you say is the, the right one then, or is it a mix of, of many? If you say anxiety may bring people to be, you know, to see it as more of a pressing issue, but not as the one that will actually make things change fast enough. So different people have, are motivated by different things. Some, for some people, fear and horror is motivating, but for other people, 
it's a turn off. And there's a lot of evidence about this. So I think it's vital that we celebrate where there have been big changes. We give people a sense of all the innovations, not just technological, but social and organizational and democratic, which are helping us to go in the right direction. And then we redouble those efforts so they are fast enough to deal with the problems. But if we only emphasize the impossibility of change, if we every time there's a COP, we say it's a total disaster, don't be surprised if many of our fellow citizens conclude nothing is possible. We might as well have fun in the present because, you know, the future we're all doomed. And there's a, this is my, one of my biggest anxieties at the moment, is that so many people can very vividly see a future of total environmental climate catastrophe and really struggle to see a more positive pathway through all the challenges. And I think we've often overshot. We are more fatalistic than we need to be. Mm -hmm. I would like to talk about this a bit later, but first I want to hear a bit more um, about Andrew's research, uh, because you told me earlier in a talk that you would consider society as a sort of superorganism. And these superorganisms exist in nature as well, as we know. What, what can we learn from that? And, and maybe explain a bit more what a superorganism is. Sure, okay. This is a, a really big question. Um, so, well, a, a super... Uh, okay, let's, let's maybe just lead up to this a little bit. So, uh, let's go on a little journey back into the very early history of the Earth when there were just little unicellular organisms swimming around in the oceans. Um, they, they competed with each other for resources, but over time, over very long periods of time, they began to cooperate with each other just through chance. They began to form little colonies, and it turned out that those colonies were able to outcompete some of the more selfish competitors around them. And that same process um, has happened repeatedly throughout evolutionary history. It's called a major evolutionary transition in individuality. It's when a bunch of individuals become essentially components of a, of a collective, and their identity becomes very strongly collected, uh, con connected to the the success of, of the collective. Um, and your, your body is, in fact, every one of you, your body is one of these, right? You, you are a society of trillions of cells, and those cells are descended from unicellular organisms in the ancient oceans, and they've learned to cooperate in the trillions, right? Global population currently is 8 billion or so. So um, cooperation very, between very large numbers of formerly selfish agents is, is possible. Um, now, when you go one step up from the organism, you arrive at the superorganism. So, the, the most famous examples are the eusocial insects, like the ants and the termites, for example. And it turns out that um, many rules that describe the relationship between behavior and energy consumption in, in individual organisms um, also apply to superorganisms. Um, and there's, there's one in particular, there's, there's one rule which is really applicable here. It's called Kleiber's Law. And what Kleiber's Law says is essentially how much energy your body has to burn in order to maintain itself, just at rest, right? You're not doing anything, just as you're all sitting there now. You're all burning about 100 watts, and that depends on your mass, right? It's a, it's a very robust relationship, and it's not quite linear, but you can think of it as close, being close to one-to-one. -to -one. So if you doubled your mass, you would get a bit more efficient, actually, so you, you would use less than twice the energy, but it would still be determined by the mass that you have. Um, and this is also true for ant colonies and termite mounds and so on. So uh, this, there's this idea that's growing in popularity that we actually we should think about the global economy like a superorganism, right? Because we are, in fact, um, a society of, of billions, right? Um, so if, if we conceptualize ourselves that way, um, what, what do we learn? So the first thing is that we are not, in biological terms, we're not quite technically yet a superorganism. And to get there, it would probably take many thousands of years, right? But what we seem to be is in a transition between... Um, a bunch of nation states which had arrived at some sort of, um, that had gone through some sort of evolutionary transition in individuality, right? This f global family of nation states um, and other collectives, of course, but we can think about it like this. And now we're getting to the point where we're sort of becoming like this global community, right? But we're not quite there. Um, so when we start to think about th the energy transition, this interests me because I'm originally a physicist and more recently got interested in social dynamics and innovation and communication and so on. So there, there tend to be two narratives here. On the one side, we have this really deterministic, physically deterministic narrative that says, we're no different from any other species. We're just a, a metabolic system and we'll just continue to grow until we overshoot the carrying capacity of the Earth. We'll burn up all the resources, then everything will collapse and it will be a total calamity. At the other extreme, we've got the um, extreme techno-optimists who say, uh, markets and technology will solve all our problems. We can completely decouple uh, wealth creation and well-being from our metabolic throughput, and so we don't have to worry about any of that. Um, my question is, where do we sit on the continuum between those two things? Um, 
Now, there was one study published a, a couple of years ago that very ingeniously used some data from um, Japan, the US, and actually the whole world. Um, our colleagues uh, at the um, at the Boku in Vienna, they, they meticulously collected uh, data on the mass of physical infrastructure in various countries. So they can say in a, in a, in a literal sense, the US economy had this much mass at, in a, at a particular year, right? When you think about all the capital stock, all the buildings, all the cars, they're able to estimate fairly well. Uh, and they were able to do that for several years. So for, there's data for Japan over different years, for the US over different years, and for the global economy. And if you take, and if you also look at how much energy those economies used uh, in all those different years, and you put, and, and so if you have mass on this axis, and you have energy consumption on this axis, and you put those, those economies and the whole world economy on the same line as you have rabbits and foxes and cows and single cells and mitochondria, they all, they all basically line up. So the evidence so far up until the, the, that data, which was, I believe, the late 20th century, says that, that the amount of energy that we need to use in order to maintain ourselves, to maintain our societal complexity and function, is determined, or at least very strongly influenced, very strongly correlated with a simple parameter, how much stuff do we have around us to maintain and use? So this, this poses, uh, you know, what, th there are many things that we can draw from this. Uh, I guess the very pessimistic conclusion is that there's nothing we can do, we've built this huge economy, we're gonna keep using energy. Uh, but then, of course, we can say, well, all right, but we can decarbonize that energy, at least to some extent, right? So um, we can switch over our, our um, energy converters to something that's not producing carbon, so that will help to solve the, the climate problem. Um, but then it also speaks to some other issues, right? We're also interfering in other biogeochemical cycles, like the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle. Um, so some argue that the, the problem is not climate change per se, the problem is, is what ecologists call overshoot, is that the human superorganism has grown to a size relative to the biosphere that um, the flows that we need in order to sustain ourselves um, are now comparable to the flows of, of, the, of the whole planet, of natural systems. Um, so, uh, I, I don't have any final answers about this, and I'm aware that what I've just said maybe maybe makes things sound a little bit dire. But Let me give you a question that might sum this up a please. little bit. Um, I think a large part of human history is, you know, we see ourselves as someone who battles nature and who puts nature into its place. What difference would it make if we saw ourselves as part of that biosphere more, which we are, of course, but, you know, from... Indeed, from a, yeah. yeah. So, stories are incredibly important, and... and um, it is my view that we've been telling ourselves an essentially false story for the last few hundred years that we are separate from nature. And um, we have built an economy accordingly. Um, we, the, the stories that we have about our economic relationship to nature made sense when the human economy was quite small relative to global flows. But we've now reached a point where they're comparable to each other and the story doesn't work anymore. And that story is essentially, um, we only have to worry about what generates wealth um, in terms of our technology and, and our labor force. Nature will always be able to provide everything that, that those things need in order to run the economy and generate value, and it will always be able to absorb all the waste that we produce through our economic activities. That was fine when we were, when we were really small, but we've now reached a size where it's, where it's no longer true. So if we shift our mindset to, the, to acknowledge that, yes, actually, um, the economy is many, many things. Societies are many things, right? They're social systems, they're religious systems, they're technological systems, they're individuals, they're cooperatives, they're all these things but they're also physical systems. We also exist, every part of an economy exists in the physical universe and obeys physical laws. We are a part of nature and we will never not be a part of nature. So if we can shift our story to there and start putting ecological numbers on our operations, right? Move our, our models of how we operate to a, an ecological economics rather than an economics that sees nature as external to the economy, I think that's maybe the crucial step to get real about what we actually have to do to, to decarbonize um, the whole, not just decarbonize, but um, bring our society into, into balance with the biosphere. And, and maybe bringing it back to the, to the climate justice and, and, and inequality debate, do you think, I mean, I don't know if it's directly related, but it made me think that, you know, how can we deny people who have been poor in the past and are now gathering wealth that so far, taken from our experience, is based on fossil fuels? How do we tell the story in a way, or how do we make this transformation to detach wealth from the system that is destroying our planet and yeah, harming us as humanity? This is kind of the crucial question. I think now that I was listening to you, I was like, a question came up in my mind, whether in other super metabolisms is inequality an issue? 
Great question. That's something that I'm currently looking into, actually. So, okay. um, uh, it, it is. There are there are no even within your body, the metabolic rate of different cells uh, are, are different um, because they perform different functions within the system. Um, I don't understand this yet as well as I would like to to fully answer your question. Um, but yeah, I think that's a fascinating one. So the, in the system that we currently have. We, we've got this, this n not only wealth inequality, but metabolic inequality that's growing between different sectors of or, or the different uh, wealth classes in society, right? Um, uh, and we can talk a lot about why that's happening. But um, I, as far as I know, the, the, spre the spread of metabolic rates of the cells in your body or of ants in a, in a colony, um, they're not on the order of thousands or millions of times different, which is kind of what we're, what we're approaching now or probably maybe even gone beyond in the human economy. Um, so when you reach that level of inequality in, in an organism, um, there would have to be some fairly radical redesign of the resource distribution systems, I would, I would imagine. So um, I think it's a crucial question. So you know, if we accept that we are part of nature and we behave like nature, we can look at these other systems that behave like we do, like these organisms and superorganisms. What level of equality has actually, has, has, what level of inequality has evolution allowed to survive, right? Presumably um, there are some some systems in which there's a larger inequality, but maybe that caused the system to become unstable, lose resilience, and then it was outcompeted by more egalitarian societies where the load is shared more, more equally between mm. individuals. A, a queen in an ant hive wouldn't be an example of, of inequality in a way? Oh, good question. That's, I'm gonna look into that, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if, if, you could, if you could account for the effective metabolic rate of a queen versus a, a worker or something. I, I, that's a great question. What's that ratio? I don't know. I don't know, what do you make of that? <laughs> Is that something? Yeah, thank you, very interesting indeed. Um, because I think for, the, for human societies, uh, still in plural, uh, inequality is, is indeed a huge issue, especially if you, if you look at, at, the, at, at the climate crisis, um, who is mainly responsible for it and who is affected by its consequences. Um, and on, in terms of how do we address that, I think many um, ideas have already been discussed in this very room. Um, I was very intrigued by um, this notion of we have to listen to people who are affected by it and to take their experiences seriously on, on this level. Um, unlikely alliances, for instance, with the fire brigades, but also between um, different groups of activists who have a, a joint cause would be an would be perhaps one, one practical way to go forward. Um, but I think it's very important that we re have to realize that in a way we are all in this together um, and kind of to bring a metaphor, um, we are not in the same boat, but we are in the same storm. And some people are on a yacht and some are on like the, the smaller canoes and other people are drowning. And we have to find a way um, to get through the storm together and for this, we will need probably um, find new alliances and also maybe rethink um, a bit like who, who, um, who do we relate with and who do we like want to, um, whom do, feel, do we feel close to in this fight? And maybe another analogy. Um, generally in societal structure, we often see like if we are talking about um, taxes on wealth, for instance, a very unpopular topic here in Austria. Um, people tend to be um, tend to uh, tend to express solidarity rather with with people who who would be affected by a tax on wealth, um, or think like, okay, but if there would be an inheritance tax, then maybe it, it would affect it would affect me in very like in a, in a bigger way. But we kind of have to realize very few of us will become very rich. Um, so that this would be an, a very relevant question for us. And um, a lot of us will have to rely on the social system in some way during their lives. And perhaps it's the same, the same issue with climate change. Like very few of us will be in the position to free themselves um, from the consequences of the climate crisis, but many of us will, will feel the consequences in their daily lives, be it because the heat will be unbearable um, during the summers or the glaciers are disappearing around your home village. And I think we have to kind of need this, make this shift of, of perception of, of, of who are the many, who is affected, and um, with whom are we building this solidarity community. Mm -hmm. 
we're already in the middle of the topic of, of visions, um, and I want to ask Jeff again. Uh, the title of one of your books is Another World is Possible. And I was wondering if you could give us some examples of when positive visions actually made a difference and led to um, social change and social innovation um, that we can learn from now. We can't hear right. you right now. I don't know if you're... Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. I think it's... Now it works. Yeah. So I said, could I just comment on briefly on your discussion you just had? Because I think we've seen an enormous concentration of wealth in the last 10 years. Uh, and billionaires basically contribute about 1 million times more to climate uh, carbon emissions than the average member of 90% of humanity. So there's no way we will deal with these issues unless we institute wealth taxes, limits on wealth, limits on private jets, limits on the system which thinks it's economically efficient for a billionaire to own 10 homes or 10 cars and live in, with extraordinary waste. Uh, this should be obvious. Maybe it's not obvious yet. I just wanted to also talk about the philosophy because it's very interesting in this part of the world to see a re-engagement with indigenous Aboriginal values and, uh, and, and politics, in a sense, which sees humanity as much more interwoven to nature. The boundaries don't really exist in the First Nations here. And that's beginning to have a big influence on the majority non-Aboriginal communities here in Australia. And in New Zealand in the last 10 years, there have been radical moves to give legal status, legal personhood, to nature, to a river and a national park. And New Zealand was the first country in the world to do this seriously. There's some other examples like Ecuador. And these are part of really institutionalizing what you were talking about earlier, a sense not of humans dominating nature, predators exploiting nature, but as dependent on and interwoven with nature. And in a way, that's an example of where you know, a vision, a radical idea of what could happen to law has slowly permeated into reality in two places and now is spreading everywhere. And the main argument I make in, in the book you mentioned is that in a way we've become paralyzed by on the one hand fear, legitimate fear of the future, and on the other hand, purely technological visions of the future. So even you know, progressive, well-informed people struggle to picture how their welfare system, their health, their democracy could be better a generation or now from a generation into the future. I call this an imaginary crisis, a crisis of imagination, which makes our times actually rather different from 50 years ago or 150 years ago, when there was actually a lot of imagination, a lot of a utopian thinking about radically different ways of society. And it's largely disappeared in our societies, which is why my guess is if we ask your audience, can you describe in some detail what will care look like in the year 2050? How will decisions be made? You will probably struggle to do that. And I think if we don't do the work, the hard work of vision, imagination, and set showing what the pathways to the future can be is not surprising people drift into a sullen pessimism, a fatalism. Majorities right across Europe expect their children to be worse off than them. Political timescales have narrowed down and shortened. And this is sapping our collective ability to deal with all the issues you've just been talking about. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is something for the next panel, but I still want to ask you uh, about this crisis of imagination, because I know some studies that show, you know, 2% of all scripts even tackle topics like climate change or biodiversity loss. Do you think it is also a problem of the arts and popular culture that it is not represented enough to make this part of our, our reality, talking about the present, but also drawing a picture of the future, which we only see in catastrophe movies then, or I don't know. There's been fascinating research looking at all books, for example, published in English, German, and Spanish in the last 150 years, and analyzing the sentiment in those books. And it shows from about the year 2000, 
a sharp increase in what they call cognitive distortions, catastrophizing thinking. There's been equally, about a month ago, some research looking at how progress in the future was talked about relative to fear and anxiety and showing again, in the last 20 years, a sharp decline of discussion of progress in the future and a rise in anxiety and fear. I don't think it's that the arts ignore climate change. Hollywood makes lots of movies about catastrophe, dystopias and disasters. We all have it in our brains. We dream about these things. What it's squeezed out is the sense of what might be an alternative option, a, a more utopian, a better possibility. And that's disappeared from fiction, it's disappeared from film and TV, but it's also disappeared from the universities, which have stopped working on it. So although there's lots of work on technological futures, AI, robots, drones, it's very hard to find good descriptions of what a, a care system might be in 2060, or you know, how would your community be run? And this is why I fear our imaginary crisis risks getting worse, and the arts play a fantastic role in bearing witness to us, the threats, like of climate, but they're much worse at helping us to navigate our way through to alternatives. Thank you. Um, it brings us back to something that we have discussed already, that we need powerful stories as well uh, to move forward. Um, Clara, what do, you, what do you say? What would be such a story in terms of, you know, within inequality and social justice and maybe policies that are a success story that we can, you know, look look towards. Mm, I think on a on a general level, it's very important also for policies not to be guided by fear. And exactly for this, we will need to come up with visions on how life could be better um, in in the future and also in the near future if we if we adapt progressive climate and progressive social policies. Um, in general, I was actually thinking also like after we talked about what type of, of policies might be success stories and I only came up like with very small scale thoughts, but maybe nevertheless they can be um, discussed and broadened. One thing would be, um, and it might sound very simple, but in Austria the so-called Klima ticket, this one ticket that allows you to use all public transport, which is not very expensive, which can be um, easily like scaled up and perhaps even be made um, free of charge um, for for everybody or at least for people receiving social benefits. And in my perception and also in in my work environment, it was kind of a game changer for many people um, who now actually um, found public transport so much more accessible. This is like the, the one layer. And on the other hand, if you're a little bit familiar um, with the Austrian federal structure, then it's close to a miracle that it was possible to get everyone on board. And this, this is kind of also a success story that I would, I would like to relate that, that it is actually possible to do that. Also, like given all path dependencies, given all different interests to, um, to come together and, and make good policies in a way. And if you look at other mobility policies, they're more like on a regional level. Um, also when people from different communities team up um, and establish shared mobility services, or for instance, the city of Klagenfurt very recently um, restructured the bus services and it was free of charge for um, a short period of time also to motivate people to adapt to it. Like these um, small scale policies, I think we can learn something from that on how, how they were done, who came together and how they made a change both in in infrastructure um, and then also in individual behavior, precisely because the structure enabled better individual choices. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is not now like the, the big vision and story, but this is something that, that I would like to point out also to create some optimism that it is possible to do things differently. And on many levels, actually, you mentioning, you know, people coming together and actually agreeing on something, which might be harder than actually coming up with, with an idea like this. Um, Andrew, because you talked about the negative effects that, you know, superorganisms or organisms um, also tend to show. Do you think it is important to also talk about the undesirable visions, the, the inconvenient truths and, yeah, possible collapse and what would that change in the, in the public discussion? 
Uh, sure. <coughs> um, I think it's important to um, have both a vision of um, the best case scenario, positive future, but we should also be aware of where we may be headed if we don't, if we don't turn the knobs to where we need to turn them. Um, uh, well, nature cares about what works, and um, sometimes systems are able to adapt to their environment and survive and continue into the future, and sometimes they're not, and the ones that are not are weeded out by evolution, and the ones that succeed are allowed to continue. Uh, and that's, that's part of the evolutionary process that has given rise to what we have now. And in a sense, uh, nature is kind of throwing a test at our species. We've, we've been clever enough to learn to exploit our environment at a level that no species ever has before, and we've reaped incredible short-term benefits and reached a level of domination of the biosphere that no other species ever has, at least to my knowledge. Um, but nature now is saying, okay, um, but the planet also is not infinite. Are you, are you able to solve this problem collectively or, or aren't you? And um, there are probably many ways in which we can and certainly many ways in which we may not. Um, what, what we can say is that uh, on various measures, um, climatic systems and also social systems uh, are, are destabilizing. Uh, we, we have uh, some, some of my climate scientist colleagues uh, now say categorically that we have left the cozy environment of the Holocene in which civilization evolved. So um, our species was around for many hundreds of thousands of years. It depends on how you count, maybe up to a million or so. Um, before civilization, what we call civilization, began. And um, due, as always, to many factors, but um, arguably the, the strongest one is that we exist in this stable interglacial period when the climate has provided this nice womb for a civilization to gestate and grow in. Um, and we have now pushed the climate outside of that range. There is no, and, and it's important to understand that we're, we're, not, we're not going back, it, it, at least on meaningful time scales. So if we, if we stop burning all fossil fuels tomorrow, the climate, the, the effects of our metabolism up until now will be seen in the climate for thousands of years and probably more, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, so we, we need to realize that we've created a new home for ourselves and the question is, can we adapt or, or um, and, and not only can we adapt, but can we adapt at the rate and scale required? And examples like the UK, as, as uh, Jeff brought up for us, um, uh, show that at the national level it seems to be possible. Is it possible at the global level at the required speed? That's, that's another question. That's so, question. Uh, look, uh, I don't want to dwell too much on what it might look like if, uh, because of the system is so complex we don't know what could happen. But um, I will say the thing, probably the thing that worries me the most is the, is the prospect of human conflict. So when, um, you know, history shows that when uh, resources become scarce, people start fighting with each other over what's left. And we now live in a world where we've got very effective ways of fighting with each other and there are an awful lot of us. So um, do we have sufficiently strong uh, governance and can we collaborate at a large enough scale and work towards a, a future where we will all be safe and provided for rather than flipping into this uh, survival of the fittest, every man for himself or every person for himself uh, mode and, and decide that, well, it'll be easier for us if you aren't there anymore. Um, these are things that don't sit easily with me. No. But um, uh, that's certainly not where, definitely where we have to go. There are many possible futures that look uh, much, much better than that. The question is, how do we get there? And we need to work as hard as we possibly can to do so. And we do want to end on a more positive note before we uh, open up for questions. So I want to do a last round. Um, on a concept, uh, on the concept of uh, social tipping points, uh, which we know that in a natural system there's, there's tipping points that might destabilize uh, the climatic system um, that we have no control over anymore. And scientists, scientists have branded the concept of social tipping points, meaning that some actions like the financial markets decarbonizing uh, could have a positive ripple effect as well. So I want to go with uh, Jeff first. Do you see signs of such a social tipping point or what makes you most hopeful in that regard? Well, let, let me link my answer to what, what Andrew just said. We've all been brought up with the idea that the people can elect their leaders. That's democracy. Uh, that was the result of hundreds of years of battle and struggle and only materialized when there were tipping points of revolutions and civil wars, which actually dislodged the old power structures. Very hard to predict, but they've happened again and again through history. 
I think we, will, we need a new set of tipping points where we reinvent sovereignty. So it's not just the sovereignty of us, the people now, but actually empowers the sovereignty of the biosphere and the planet and also of future generations and gives those form in the next generation of global governance structures, which we can go into. I, I've written a lot about where I think we should be going with the successors to the UN, IPCC, IFES, and so on. I can't predict when they will happen. No one can. But the UN arose because of the Second World War. It was a tipping point when suddenly a lot of ideas which had been lying around were picked up because the world was ready for them. And I think we now need to do the hard work on the next generation of equivalents, which help us as a species to cooperate, to survive, to rein in our worst patterns of behavior, to stop war, but to allow us to move to a new kind of sovereignty, which is shared with, say, the biosphere and knowledge, and which actually embeds the interest of future generations into decisions. But no social scientist can predict social tipping points. It's a nice phrase, but it remains very vague in, in reality. The world is far more complex than our minds, and we have to be humble in the face of it. Yeah, but a nice, nice concept to hold on to, I, I, I imagine. Um, Clara, what do you think? What, is, what could be such an abstract tipping point, or what makes you, what makes you hopeful? In a way, I don't know if hopeful is the right word for it, but um, climate issues and also um, inequality issues more and more become a matter of um, of power and also of, um, of the reality of, of large profit enterprises. This does not necessarily make me hopeful, but um, it's in a way, it's, it's an indicator that things might be changing also at this level and this might also like fuel further change. Um, and I would also say it's very hard to predict what will happen. I think over the past four or five years, we have all experienced things that we would ne never have expected to happen. Um, but the COVID crisis, in a way, it also showed us that if there is a crisis, at least in the first moment, we are capable of acting and we are capable of, of stepping in together and this also like this feeling that also Johannes earlier invoked in his keynote, this kind of also makes me hopeful that if the next bigger tipping point or the next actual crisis comes along, that we have learned something and we maybe can use this moment to also sustain what was there in the beginning. How about you, Andrew? What do you think? Uh, <coughs> well, tipping points is something that we talk about a lot in the research circles that I, that I work in. Um, and I agree with Jeff that they're uh, extremely complex. So we, we know that... Um, uh, some features of social behavior uh, can can show what we call threshold behavior, so incremental change followed by some sort of rapid change, a tipping point. Um, and there is historical evidence of that happening in various ways. Uh, so common examples are things like um, social norms around smoking behavior. So it used to be absolutely fine for it. You would have all been puffing away while we're sitting here, and now it's really taboo. Um, um, other sorts of uh, social justice issues, there were big watershed moments where women got the vote and, and so on and so on, right? These are very familiar, familiar examples. Um, uh, but the, the, the question, the, the, what we're facing now, the kind of tipping point that we need now, I think is more fundamental. It's, it's a tipping point around the basic biophysical function of our society. So um, can our collective social will produce a change in the physical throughput of our economy in such a way that, um, that we move into the next, the next stage? Um, things that make me hopeful about that. Uh, first of all, the system is so big, as Jeff said, it's, the world is much more complex than our minds, so we should expect the unexpected. It, it's perfectly possible that we will see some new things that will make us um, more optimistic. We'll be able to ride the wave of some change that we didn't expect and perhaps turn, turn down our collective uh, metabolism. Um, uh, I'm optimistic. Uh, the, the flip side of the level of inequality that currently exists in the system means that there are a lot of people who are used to having an awful lot right now who we know could get by just fine with much less. So my favorite way to, to frame this is um, we're all used to exponential economic growth, right? We state it as a percentage, so it sounds linear, but it's an exponential growth curve. So if you look back at the, the level of um, wealth that we had, say, around uh, 2000 or the late 1990s, 
that's something like one doubling time back from where we are now. So the level of wealth in the system, the level of GDP was about 50% then of where it is now. I personally did not feel impoverished in the year 2000. I thought it was just fine. Um, so, and, and, and I'm just a regular guy, right? If you think about the number of billionaires out there, um, I mean, look, maybe some of you worked really hard to get where you are, but if you have to deal with the middle class lifestyle so that we can continue with life on earth, perhaps that's something to aim for. Um, so there's a lot of fat in the system and um, it, it, we can certainly do without the level of consumption that we currently have and still live fulfilled lives. And, and in fact, um, there are good arguments why um, pursuing so-called degrowth policies could um, make life better for many. And th these are, there's broad support for these things. So things like um, reducing the number of working hours, right? Um, uh, job sharing, I'm not an expert on how these policies work, but my understanding is essentially um, uh, individual people working less and sharing the fruits of our collective labor with all of us more equitably instead of letting it all flow up to capital where the billions are already hanging out. Uh, and yeah, that, that would uh, allow dramatic changes, I think. Uh, and finally, as a scientist, I would say I'm, I'm um, very happy that the tools of complex system science that we need to actually study these systems um, are now very rapidly uh, developing. We, we've reached, so far we have dealt with complexity in the world um, through natural science and social science and economics. Our, our main approach to complexity is to find ways to pretend it away. We have a complex system, let's find ways to look at it so that it looks kind of simple and then we'll use the tools that we know work really well in simple systems to understand it as best we can. But now for the first time we are reaching a point where we have scientific tools that allow us to actually embrace complexity and really understand how complex systems work. I mean, we'll probably never really understand how systems as complex as the global biosphere and, and economy work, but we are at a point now where we've got the best chance that we've ever had of understanding how these systems work and how we can steer them in a way that, that best serves our goals. You will not use, uh, lose your job in the next uh, years, I can imagine. I hope not. That's the, uh, that's the yeah. flip side. <laughs> Great. Uh, I want to open up to, to questions. I think there's two mics that are wandering around or will soon be wandering around. Are there any questions that you have? Also for Jeff. Yes. There's one. Oh, yeah. In the back first. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, just because you drew all the analogies to nature and that humanity can be seen as a super organism. I was wondering, is there a way to positively reframe this? Because the observations you made were quite dismal <laughs> in a way. And also in terms of, I think it's difficult to make the top 1% understand that a redistribution of wealth is necessary and such. And showing them that the way a lot of humans in the 21st century are living is unnatural compared to the animal kingdom. Because I don't know if we talk about imagination, how helpful the scenario that you pointed out with, we have outgrown our environment and the resources it delivers can be if we want to convince the masses that such a change is necessary. I, I take it you're directing to me. Yeah, would, yeah would, I mean any of you, okay. if you could think of I, I analogies didn't. to the natural world that could encourage people to accept policies more easily or adapt their behavior. Well, for, for, for my part, so one, one way to see how complexity has evolved in the natural world is through a process called multi-level selection. And um, in my view, the engine of that process is one of the most important concepts that we can get our heads around right now. Some people call it the essential tension. Um, it's the tension between cooperation and competition at different levels of a complex system. So the, the story that we, typically when people talk about economic systems, uh, we're all stuck with this binary from the 20th century. On the one hand, you've got state communism. On the other hand, you've got extreme free market economies, and some people argue for complete libertarianism with no regulation at all. And so in those two scenarios, you've got a, a completely selfish atomistic system, and you've got a completely top-down collective system with no freedom for the individual, right? But if you look at how complex systems work in the real world, that is, complex systems that have survived the evolutionary process to, to be with us where we are, so they're resilient, they all sustain a dynamic uh, tension, a dynamic balance between those things. Sometimes the individuals um, will forego their own individual selfish needs to some extent in order to serve the needs of the many. 
Um, and sometimes institutions will prioritize the freedom of individuals because it serves the goal, because it serves the collective. So the systems that, that we have developed are the systems that have survived evolution. And perhaps I should clarify something here. When I talk about evolution, um, maybe we're thinking just genetic evolution, right? So um, yes, genetic evolution is one process, but it's incre increasingly clear that um, there, there are other forms of information transmission from one generation to the next. And in human societies, it's culture, right? So, um, and, and other things, but let's say culture. So when I say evolution, I don't just mean evolution at the bodily level, I mean evolution of cultures as well, right? And individuals pay, play a part within that culture. So, uh, to get where we are, we, we have undergone this process of multi-level selection where competition and cooperation uh, complement each other. And uh, the short story is that when you have a, when you have a collective, Selfish individuals tend to profit within that collective if everybody else is behaving pro-socially, right? Um, this is a familiar uh, situation. If everybody's working for the group, I can be a little bit selfish and take a little more for myself and then I'm better off than those people around me. Yeah, but then what we see is if another collective comes along and that collective is more cooperative and there's a conflict between these two collectives, the one that's more cooperative tends to win out, which means that there's always, there, each individual is always being pushed in two directions. Should I be more should I be, uh, be more selfish or should I be more collective? And the environment that comes along, the particular environmental conditions at that level of organization in the system determine what the answer to that question is at any particular moment. So we are now at a point where, where we, um, have, we can leverage these ideas and we can come up with a new way of, of organizing ourselves that, that uses these principles, right? All we had in the past was simple ideas about how individuals interact to produce an economy so we all have to be really individualistic and selfish and that actually does the best for all of us, right? That's clearly not the case or it's only the case when you make very simplifying assumptions. On the other hand, if you have this draconian top-down state socialism, we also see that that's unstable and not particularly innovative, right, for, for reasons that, have, that are very widely known. So if we can find a balance between those things, right, we can, if we can do what superorganisms do well, they survive and prosper because they are able to negotiate the essential tension, right? We now have the ideas and the tools to be able to develop these, uh, these governance based on this principle. So um, I, I take hope from that. Can I, sum correct me if I'm wrong, but to summarize this, the analogy would be not survival of the fittest with which everybody associates with evolution, but that cooperation is, can actually be a stronger principle than that. Absolutely. So survival of the fittest is still a thing, but it's the answer to how to survive through fitness is not to be as, so, as, as selfish as possible. Right. Yeah, it's to trade off between selfishness and pro-social traits or, or, or tendencies, strategies, um, based on circumstances. And the way that, the way that you can um, make sure that that balance works is through good governance structures, well-designed markets, technologies that utilize these ideas, right? So it's, it's understanding how the system works as a as a, an example of a very broad class of systems that, that evolution has, has produced. Great. There was another question uh, in the middle. Yeah, um, thanks. Unfortunately, again, to Andrew mainly, um, because of the nature analogies, it, I found it really intriguing, the, one, um, the correlation between mass and energy throughput. At the same time, um, nature analogies have often been used and are still used um, for, to um, argue for racism, for rape culture, etc. And uh, so it's also often a simplification that's very dangerous. And because this analogy specifically seems quite simple and nice in that way, like what's, how do you protect yourself from this, like, or this kind of theory? What's the difference between more um, toxic analogies that are misused? Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I guess there's some a different approach. It's not as, as simplistic as the others, but I would like you to elaborate on that and maybe also positively outlooking what kind of, maybe on a policy level, what conclusions we can draw from this kind of analogy if we say, okay, that's what, it, there is the truth in that, yeah. Thanks. Okay, well, I think the short answer is to um, be scientifically humble and realize that we don't yet have a full, complete theory of how these systems work. Um, of, of course, it's the case that um, People sitting on a kind of um, authoritative appearing scientific high horse have come, have promoted all kinds of um, scientific ideas that weren't, or, or scientific seeming ideas that actually weren't weren't supported by the science, right? I mean, there's there's no scientific basis for the concept of race, to my to my knowledge, right? It's more like a continuum. There's no this group and that group and this group. Uh, I should say I'm not a, an expert there, but that's I mean, the, the, when the science wasn't very well developed, 
um, it was easier for, for people to say, it is this way, therefore we can justify all these kinds of things. And my short answer is don't do that, right? Just be honest about the level of, of understanding that we, that we have and use, use the tools that, that allows us to, to um, or, or develop tools that, that empowers us to use, but do so with humbleness and expect to be surprised that nature is actually more complex than we thought it was. And when the data tell us that our theories are wrong, update the theories, don't ignore the data, right? We, we have a bit of a tendency collectively to, to have a theory about this is how society works or this is how the economy works. And even when the, the data say, sorry, bub, doesn't work that way, we're so addicted to our theories that we just, oh, well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable where I am with this theory, so I'll just ignore the data, right? But we, we can't afford to do that, um, particularly when we reach the, the, the point that we're at now. So, yeah, just do the science well. And science is about uncertainty. It's not about knowing things. It's about what you don't know. Maybe let's pass this ball quickly to Jeff because his last book was about science and power and this relationship. So how do you how, how do you take that? Do you think that there's a truth to that, that you know we stick to theories that we feel comfortable with and politics tends to do that as well? We're, we're certainly surrounded by what I call zombie theories, which have outlived lots of contrary evidence. And uh, as Andrew said, the natural world is full of both competition and cooperation. One of the reasons I'm fascinated by the science of collective intelligence is that it's showing among birds and insects and bees as well as humans, there are lots of patterns of collaboration and cooperation as well as competition. We as humans, though, have amplified both to an unprecedented scale, the competition of nuclear weapons, but also the cooperation of the internet and the United Nations, uh, and so on. And I think various things flow from that. One actually is about the 1%. So we know that it's human nature to resent free riders, people who take more than they give, as you described. And in the past, that led, for example, in Germany, in the 16th century, to massacres of the rich by the poor. <laughs> they just became so angry, uh, they killed lots of rich people. Now, maybe the correction we will have in the next 10 or 20 years will be a little bit you know, calmer and wiser than that. I think it also affects how we think about growth, which has come up several times in this discussion. To my mind, the 20th century view that all growth was good uh, regardless of its form, which many economists promoted, is very anachronistic. But so is the mirror view that growth is bad and that we'd all be better off with zero growth or negative growth. To my mind, what we should really aspire to is growth of the things we want, which includes intelligence, wisdom, care, uh, and degrowth of use of matter and energy and the things we don't want. And that still depresses me that the growth versus anti-growth debate has hardly moved in 30 or 40 years and is still stuck in this 20th century frame which isn't a systems way of thinking about how the world works. Thank you. Are there any more questions? There's one here in the front. Um, hello, thank you. I have a question for Jeff. Um, we, as we are sitting here, are with the uh, Letzte Generation, Last Generation in Austria, and we are deeply worried by the repression of climate protests everywhere, but especially in the UK. And we wanted to know, uh, what is your take on the protests of our sister organization, Just Stop Oil, in the UK? Well, we've had a fairly lively protest uh, culture in the last few years, uh, from Extinction Rebellion in particular, and then, as you say, Just Stop Oil, who have been uh, blocking roads, attacking art in museums and, and, and trains. I absolutely support most of what they're arguing, especially about um, insulation, which is one of their big messages. But I think there's a tactical question which any political movement has to face, is you need to do some things to get attention, to shock people, to shift the debate. But then at some point you have to create coalitions. And so when Just Stop Oil started blocking the daily commutes of fairly low-income uh, people trying to get to work, they actually lost a lot of support. 
and they probably weakened the coalition which has to be built around their politics. And as I say, every movement has to go through different stages. Usually there is a stage where you can be much more aggressive, provocative, you know, and actually often encourage being arrested. But if you don't move to a second stage where you build inclusive coalition, you don't achieve the lasting change, especially in policy, in tax, and in regulation. And this has been a constant story of green movements all over the world in the last 30 or 40 years. How do you, how do you handle those shifts? So I completely oppose our government, which is trying to tighten up laws of protest of all kinds. That is definitely not to be welcome. But I think it's also important the advocates of change empathize, understand the people who may not agree with them, talk to them, get a sense of where they're coming from rather than just seeing them as the enemy. Because if you see them as the enemy, they may well behave as the enemy. And I think in all of our societies, we are often a bit trapped in our own bubbles, our own echo chambers, where we only talk to people who think like us. But actually, increasingly, it's vital we talk in a spirit of mutual respect to people who strongly disagree with us and come from a different place. And some of the Just Stop Oil protesters have not been very good at that jump of empathy to deal with the other side. That's probably not the answer you wanted, but it's, it's my answer. I was just going to ask, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Are there, there's one more question here. Um, I would be very interested in what all of you guys think um, about, so we agreed that cooperation will be um, one of the most necessary tools to um, tackle the climate crisis. And when we think about a future where this cooperation happens and um, how important will it be to institutionalize this cooperation, or um, is this also something that could um, also um, fulfill um, its benefits from a very small scale upwards, so like grassroots um, cooperation that doesn't have to be that institutionalized. Maybe you want to take um, this question? Yeah. Um, maybe also adding on a bit on, on Jeff's take before, um, I think from a civil society perspective, it's always helpful to kind of have a, also a division of labor between uh, established organizations and, and social movements because um, activists such as um, Block Gas is a bigger deal now in Austria, also um, Extinction Rebellion, they can be much more radical than other organizations who are, at least in the Austrian social system, are much more dependent on cooperation also with um, the, the like politics and, and the, social, like the social policy structure. So I think there is a huge potential um, to have cooperation on, on this level and to tackle different groups and different perspectives um, from wherever you are at and from whom, whomever you are working with. Um, and also maybe on the bigger picture on cooperation versus competition, I would maybe like to add that we can also think about what um, what areas of society are just much better organized in a cooperative and perhaps also in a top-down state-organized way. Um, for instance, in some, some areas, markets um, work very well. There is probably no reason to abolish uh, market logics at all. But if you look, um, for instance, at, at housing, it's a very bad idea to use housing as a commodity on the market. So this could be maybe a sector where we say, okay, we take this off the market and we take this into collective responsibility and think about how we can organize it in a cooperative way and um, give priority to cooperation rather than competition. Does anybody else want to reply to this question of whether we need to institutionalize this or keep it on, you know, as a grassroots movement rather? Uh, well, I, I guess continuing from what I tried to express before, um, what we need to do is, is engineer a system that accounts for the tension between cooperation and competition because both are needed at, a, at every level of organization, right? Um, typically, and, and ironically, it's competition between groups that tends to breed cooperation within them, right? Think about sports teams, you know? You, you, you can take a currently star football team or something and take them out of the league and send them to some distant island, they're probably not going to be very good football players by the end of it because they don't have any competition that's pushing them to work well together, right? So um, 
yeah, in, in, in my view, I think we really need to take this, this idea of the, this dynamic balance between competition and cooperation to heart and, and ask ourselves, how does this work in this particular system? And as, as Clara expressed, there are some examples where markets solve, solve problems very well, but the problem, one of the problems of our thinking, in my view, over the last 50 years is that we've, we've caught this incredible marketization disease where we think that markets will solve everything always, forever, right? But there are lots of examples where markets don't work particularly well at all. So what works, what doesn't work when, when uh, sorry, what works when the market doesn't? Well, other kinds of cooperative, cooperative uh, um, arrangements, right? Different kinds of institutions, formal or informal. Um, it's different, it depends on the context. So I guess my short answer is, it depends on the problem that you're trying to solve, right? What, what's the system? What's the problem? What do we know about how it works? Um, what is the governance design that will work best for that situation? And if, it's, if you need to institutionalize some kind of reinforcement of a cooperative system, then do it. If it works, do it. Can, can I just comment on this? Because I think this is an absolutely critical question for the next few years. We can cooperate spontaneously, all of us do it all the time, but nearly all the really serious large-scale cooperation happens through institutions, whether it's the European Union, our government, trade unions or big NGOs. And I think in the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a lot of institutional innovation in some fields, like in digital business, the arrival of TikTok or Meta or whatever, but a real dearth of institutional innovation around the big challenges of our times. And I'm part of a new initiative called the Institutional Architecture Lab, which is absolutely focusing on the institutions we need in the next 10 or 20 years, whether it's around decarbonization or artificial intelligence or mental health, which will get us to the next stage of, uh, of cooperation in essence. And there's been a dramatic loss of confidence by governments and democracies around the world to create the institutions we need, leaving a whole series of, of gaps which make it harder for us to cooperate than what we need. And yet past periods like the 1940s left all of our countries with a whole suite of new institutions which just made it much easier for us to help cooperate together than had been the case beforehand. So this question of how to design the needed institutions is one which I hope you know, all of us will focus on in the next 10 or 20 years because we can't just rely on spontaneous goodwill. The real lesson of history, that's nice, but it's never enough to really drive serious, large-scale, sustained cooperation. I think we have time for one more question. There's one in the back. Um, I would like to ask this question, what influence or what uh, outcome uh, has um, the war uh, for the nature? Because when we are thinking at all these incredible weapons systems and what's blowing out in the air every day, uh, I would say, uh, why doesn't the whole world like scream out for peace now and ceasefire and negotiations now? Uh, I'm missing a little bit the discourse about the, how do you say, output of the of the war uh, in 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 sense of of our environment, our natural uh, ecological uh, issues. I think Andrew touched on it when he uh, talked about human conflict that he was worried about, so I don't know if you want to extend. Uh, are are you asking specifically about current, uh, current conflict? I, I, well, uh, about the, the war in Ukraine, for example, or also in, in Gaza. And, uh, what's okay, uh, ooh, so um, a, a colleague of mine at the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna, named Peter Turchin, um, has, uh, he, he's written many books, but he, he wrote a book called uh, Ultra Society, and the subtitle is uh, How 10,000 Years of War Have Made Humans the Most Cooperative Species on Earth. Um, and indeed, by, um, by most measures, we, we are the most cooperative species on Earth, which is radically different to this, to this extreme kind of selfish, uh, every person for themselves story that we've been telling ourselves for the last half century. Um, a simple measure is, uh, the largest polities in the world, right? Think about China, you've got a polity of almost one and a half billion people. There's some sense in which all those people are cooperating through institutions, right? And even the ants and the insects and so on don't reach that level of cooperation. Um, how did we get there? Well, Turchin's theory, um, which relates to what I was talking about with multi-level selection before, um, is that the largest threat that we focus, that, that, that human groups faced through most of our, of our history 
uh, was actually conflict with other groups, and that drove cooperation within groups. Um, so th this is this is the irony of the essential tension, right? It, it's um, why are we warlike? Well, because it served our past, it's, it served our, our ancestors. Um, that's a really ugly truth, and I'm certainly not trying to promote war at, at all. I wish we could get rid of it. But when you look at it through a complex systems and evolutionary perspective, it seems to be the case that um, cooperating in conflict situations um, is something that drove us to be who we have become now. Uh, one of the results of, of that is that we became very innovative, um, not only with, with how we could design weapons to hurt each other, but um, the social systems and the economic systems that we could design in order to um, enrich and empower ourselves as groups that would give us an advantage against other groups. Uh, so we've got to a point now where we've got potentially world-ending weapons, um, but also we've, we've got um, global uh, technologies, the internet, right, that allows us to speak instantaneously with people all over the planet. So these are the, the, the two-sided um, outcomes of, of what war has, has done for us. Uh, so now, because we are so um, powerful and our metabolism is so large and we still have a, a ready supply of fossil fuels to power our war machines, at least for some time, um, we can, of course, produce massive impacts on, on nature through our, through our uh, war, and obviously at a much larger level than we ever could in the past, right? The, the, the hundreds of thousands of years of war that produced the brains and the social uh, tendencies that we have, they didn't have machine guns, they had much simpler weapons. So we're now at this place where we are Pleistocene apes out of place, where um, we come from a much simpler time, and we've... Uh, a Harvard biologist called E.O. Wilson, in 2009, he said, the real problem with humanity is that we have Stone Age, uh, Stone Age emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. Um, and I think that speaks pretty well to, to um, how we conduct ourselves around conflict. Um, but look, I'll end on a positive note and say that it is remarkable that we don't fight more, right? There are eight billion of us, um, and uh, we're all trying to get as rich as possible, at least in our current system. Um, and and for, for a time, we've been able to stay reasonably peaceful. So we should be proud of that, um, but let's not be complacent because uh, as the system destabilizes, uh, tensions will probably continue to grow, so we have to be ever more vigilant. Maybe there was one more question. If it's quick, then we can, we can take it, if it's still there, yeah. Thanks. So... Uh, my question relates mainly to cooperation and the incentive to cooperation that different nations might have. So there seems to be huge differences and inequalities which might not make cooperation beneficial for everyone. And especially when we propose certain degrowth policies, many people seem to have even less incentives. So in order to make people to cooperate, how much do we need to, for instance, um, invent certain new quality of life indexes, for instance, that will not be just related to GDP or income or whatever, but will uh, in certain way imply certain inequalities in uh, enjoying substantive freedom or capabilities or functions that need to change in order to make people cooperate in general? Maybe you can answer this. Um, yeah, I, I would say this is a very, it's a very good option to think about um, of inventing really new measures for how do we measure well-being. And GDP, it was kind of a random invention, as some of you probably know. Um, capabilities would be a great approach, I agree with you. Um, and whatever we come up with, we need to be really careful of what will be visible. Um, and what do we put out there in terms of um, what do we want to measure and then also what, what people will, will want to achieve. Um, and I think there is indeed, you can see all those indicators and how to measure well-being and other stuff. You can see that really critical, but there is, of course, there is a certain power in it um, also to, to guide what people aspire for. So I think this is really something that we will need to pursue also um, collectively and in cooperation, um, what, what will we come up with in the future? And how will we take different aspects of, of the good life for society and people and also sustainable life within planetary boundaries into account? Just to give one last word to Jeff, because I think you've written about this uh, as well, if I remember correctly. Is this a way, or how can we incorporate these, these values into our um, economic systems? Yeah, so it's vital we measure the things we care about. 
there's been a huge amount of work in the last 30 or 40 years on new measures of both ecological footprints and well-being. In the UK, our statistical office has been measuring happiness since 2010. Many others have been doing it around the world. I think, don't think anyone thinks GDP should be the only measure of societal success anymore. But on its own, that's not going to create cooperation. And so just one final comment on how this links to war. Um, we have both competition and cooperation. The Second World War led to the creation of the UN, which was meant to stop nations invading other nations. And this actually is the best time to be a small nation ever in human history, because most of them are not about to be eaten by their neighbor. In the 50s, the threat of nuclear disaster led to the creation of institutions to stop nuclear proliferation to reduce the risk of nuclear war. And now, in this very dangerous period, with a war like Russia, a war like China, we need new institutions, particularly around artificial intelligence and war, and the enormous danger of a new generation of automated warfare, which could be just as dangerous as nuclear weapons, but at the moment we have no institutions at a global level to promote co cooperation and stop really, really damaging competition. And that's where I think some of these threads come up together. Well, thank you all so much. I think we'll end here. Thank you all for your questions and for listening and being patient. And yes, see you later, probably. <laughs>